Rethinking a Quantum Eraser Experiment. Hi, I'm Jeff Boyd. In this video, we're going to discuss one of the most famous experiments in physics, namely yun Hu Kim. The experiment is a delayed choice quantum eraser published in 1999. In this discussion, we're going to think outside the box and quantum mechanics is the box outside of which we are going to think. I'm going to not use the following quantum mechanics concepts. Wave particle duality, non-locality, superposition of photons, wave function collapse, entanglement, complementarity, and backwards in time cause and effect. None of those will we use. Instead, we will use something called the theory of elementary waves. Now, I hope by the end of this video to convince you that it is possible to understand this experiment without the thought of delayed choice, without the thought of there being a quantum eraser, and without complementarity. The general plan here is to take a quantum mechanics experiment try to explain it from a quantum mechanics point of view without the mathematics, and then explain how we rethink that same experiment, and by using the exact same experiment and the same data, arrive at drastically different conclusions. That's what we're trying to do in this video. In the double slit experiment, you can see interference fringes on the target screen, which means that somewhere there are waves and wave interference. You cannot know, however, which slit the photon or photon wave came through. If you try to learn the latter, it turns out that this pattern disappears. Now, there are two explanations of why the pattern disappears. One is called complementarity, which I won't describe further, and the other is the explanation that I'm about to give, a non-complementarity explanation. In order to investigate this phenomenon, John Wheeler proposed a thought experiment, or Gedanken experiment, in which he would allow a photon or photon wave to be fired one at a time over here, and after it had passed through the double slit barrier, but had not yet reached the target screen, he would remove the target screen in his thought experiment and put a couple of telescopes back here to register, well, which slit did it come through? What do you think the result would be? It's a very interesting idea, but a little bit problematic in terms of practicality. This photons traveling at the speed of light, how could you ever remove this screen fast enough? Over the years, a variety of experiments have been conducted trying to implement Wheeler's delayed choice Gedanken experiment. Of these, the most successful was the one conducted by Kim et al., the Delayed Choice Quantum Eraser Experiment, published in 1999, in which they took a traditional double-slit experiment like this, and a BBO crystal, which we're going to pretend this is, and they put the BBO crystal here, behind the double-slit barrier. So now you have photon waves, or photons, going through a traditional double-slit experiment. Now, the nature of a BBO crystal is that it splits a photon into two entangled photons called a signal and idler photon, which go in slightly different directions. The signal photon goes up here to the target screen and registers or doesn't register an interference fringe pattern. The idler photon goes off in a different direction where we can detect it in two different ways. One in which we know, and in the other we do not know which slit the photon came through. We will say that this coin is a detector called D0. Now D0 can move this way across, this, uh, across these interference fringes uh, three millimeters one way or the other, and you could see very easily that 
if this detector counts how many photons uh, strike it at each position, then you wouldn't need the target screen. So what do you think Kim et al. discovered from their experiment? Here you have detector D0, which is detecting the signal photon 8 nanoseconds before any detector detects the idler photon. If the idler photon strikes detector D1, and we do not know through which slit the photon came and can think of it as if it were a wave going through both slits simultaneously, then it turns out that we preserve, we get what we expect. We get this interference fringe pattern on the target screen. If, on the other hand, the idler photon strikes detector D3, allowing us to know that previously the photon had come through slit A, then it turns out that in the final data set, we cannot see this interference fringe uh, pattern, which is odd because this photon arrived and registered eight nanoseconds before its twin arrived and registered. Now we do know, according to quantum mechanics, but not according to me, that with entangled photons, uh, in my theory there is no such thing as entanglement, entangled photons, if you constrain one, then that changes the behavior of the other one, and apparently it changes it backwards in time. So that's why it's called a delayed choice quantum eraser experiment. It's delayed choice because it is believed that this information here is registered 8 nanoseconds before the idler photon tells us or fails to tell us which slit the photon came through. It's a quantum eraser because the, apparently the interference fringe pattern here is erased backwards in time if the idler photon tells us, well, it came through only one of the slits, slit A. Now those results are thought to be consistent with a wide range of quantum mechanics ideas, especially the idea of complementarity. Niels Bohr, for example, spoke of complementarity. I don't agree with any of that. I'm going to present now a non-quantum mechanics way of understanding this experiment with the same experiment and the same results. In our understanding, which I'm about to present, there will be no delayed choice, no erasure of data, and no need for the principle of complementarity. The idea we're going to use instead is called the theory of elementary waves, which has the waves going in the other direction. Uh, waves start at every point on the target screen, waves start from detectors D1 and D3, they go backwards through the BBO crystal and they cause interference. The waves from the right and the left slit interfere over here at the laser prior to the emission of a photon. When Yun Ho Kim et al. conducted this experiment, this is the apparatus they used. You can see the double slit barrier and the BBO crystal. Now at the upper part here you can see a traditional double slit experiment with detector D0 moving up and down the x-axis. And down below you can see a complicated apparatus of other detectors of which the ones I'm going to focus on are D1 and D3. In order to simplify our discussion I'm going to use a stripped down uh, version of this apparatus. We're going to remove detector D2, we're going to remove a whole bunch of mirrors and things like that. A lot of bells and whistles will be absent uh, and I'm going to have a very simple uh, experimental apparatus so you can follow what the heck I'm talking about. Here's a typical double slit experiment. On the left is a photon source, in the middle is a barrier with two slits, and on the right is a detector D0. According to our unconventional way of thinking, waves come out of the detector, go through the two slits, and the upper and lower wave interfere at the photon source. The probability of a photon being emitted in response to these waves 
it is directly proportional to the intensity of the impinging waves. If a photon is emitted, it will follow one and only one wave with a probability of one backwards through one and only one slit to the detector D0 where it is registered. We can move the detector D0 up and down, which will profoundly affect the interference at the photon source, which in turn has a tremendous effect on how many photons are emitted. Thus, at each position of D0, you will find more or less photons arriving. Thus, the final data set of D0, which has interference fringes, it's because those interference fringes represent the reality of what is happening at the photon source. This diagram shows us when to expect maxima in the waves impinging on the photon source. There is a relationship between the distance d between the two slits, the angle theta, and the wavelength lambda. When there is a maxima in the waves impinging on the source, there will be a maxima in the number of photons emitted by the source in response to those waves, and therefore, a maxima in the number of photons detected by D0. Thus, to reiterate, there are interference fringes in the data set collected by D0 because D0 is accurately detecting what's going on in reality and the reality it detects is what's going on with the waves impinging on the photon source. This equation, d sine theta equals m lambda, is the equation you find in standard textbooks of physics. One part of this theory of elementary waves that we've been using to explain these experiments that is odd is that waves are coming out of the detectors. How can that be? Well, these experiments only make sense if everywhere in nature there are waves of all wavelengths going in all directions at the speed of light conveying no energy. Now let's introduce into our Gedanken experiment a BBO crystal right beside the barrier with the double slits. What is the function of a BBO crystal? The conventional view is that it takes a photon of 351 nanometers wavelength and splits it into two entangled photons of twice that wavelength. The unconventional view is that it takes two elementary waves of 702 nanometers wavelength and merges them into one. Now, if a photon of 351 nanometers wavelength subsequently follows that elementary wave, the photon will naturally split apart because it is following its waves. The photon itself has no intrinsic cohesiveness. The two offspring photons are called the signal and idler. Now, the signal photon follows elementary waves coming from detector D0. In our drawings, those are blue or red waves, depending on which slit the parent photon came through. We need another detector, which we will call detector D1, from which red and blue elementary waves come, which the idler photon will follow. Again, the red and the blue refer to which slit the parent photon came through. The idler photon will follow one of these back to D1, where it will click and register. Now we collect data from the joint clicking of detectors D1 and D0. D0 clicks 8 nanoseconds prior to D1. Now what do the data look like when we link together data coming from D0 and D1? From these detectors, we cannot tell which slit a photon went through, and according to complementarity principle, that means we should be able to see interference fringes in the final data. According to our theory, the fact that we don't know which slit the photon came from is because both slits are open to elementary waves going backwards through them. These are elementary waves of 351 nano meters wavelength, the same as the photon, and the wave through the upper and the lower slit interfere at the photon's source. Therefore, 
Data from D0 will reflect the interference that is occurring in reality at the photon source, which in turn means that elementary waves were coming both through the upper and the lower slit to cause that interference, and it is this, rather than our inability to distinguish the upper and lower slit, that is the reason for the presence of the interference fringes in the final data set. So far we have been discussing the situation in which we do not know which slit a photon comes through and interference fringes are visible in the final data. Let's discuss the other possibility, the possibility in which we do know which slit the photon comes through and there are no interference fringes visible in the final data set. We need another detector which we will call D3. We're going to insert a beam splitter into the experiment. The nature of the beam splitter is to let half the photons go straight through and the other half to be reflected at an angle. We will insert the beam splitter here and shift from detector D1 to D3. As you can see, if a photon were to strike detector D3, then that photon must have come on the blue line, which means through slit A, the lower of the two slits. So we therefore know which of the two slits that photon would have come from. Now we're going to think in terms of elementary waves. Elementary waves come from this detector D3, and from D0. From D3 come blue waves and from D0 red and blue and they all join in the center. What we have here is a red and blue wave coming down from above from D0 and only a blue wave coming up from D3. So when the red wave from above looks for its mate, the other red wave, it is not present. Therefore they cannot join together, they cannot form a parent elementary wave of 351 nanometers that would penetrate backwards through the upper slit and therefore there is no red wave going towards the photon source. On the other hand, with the blue waves, there is a mate. The two of them join together, form a 351 nanometer wavelength elementary wave going to the photon source. Now at the photon source, there is no interference. Why? Because you only have one wave. It requires two waves to interfere. You only have one of them. So because there's no interference, you know what the final data is going to look like. It's going to show no interference. And furthermore, the photon, which is 351 nanometers in wavelength, will not respond to any wave of a different wavelength coming from the upper of the two slits. And so, because there is no wave interference at the photon source, therefore, there will be no interference detected by detector D0. Consequently, the final data discovered by detector D0 will look like this. From a complementarity point of view, if you know which slit the photon came through, you will not be able to see interference fringes. However, we have a slightly different explanation of the same phenomena. From our point of view, if there is no interference detected in the final data at D0, that means that there was no interference at the photon source, which would happen if elementary waves were coming at the photon source through only one of the two slits. Thus, we concur with the complementarity principle that if only one slit is used then there will be no interference fringes in the final data set but we have a different reason for that. Somewhere, somehow inside this experiment for each photon or photon wave a decision is made as to whether to move in a direction of showing an interference fringe pattern on the target screen or not. Now where and when is that decision made? Do you think it's made at the target screen, deciding whether to go through both slits or only one? Do you think it's made in the BBO crystal? In the old days, people used to say, well, it's made at the target screen when there is wave function collapse and all of a sudden a dot appears one place or the other. According to Others, 
uh, the decision is made later, eight, eight nanoseconds later, when the final data set is collected. I don't agree with any of those ideas. I think that a decision is made at the, at the laser, long before all these other places. At the laser, each photon or photon wave has to, actually we don't think of photon waves, each photon has to decide which elementary wave to follow. The great mystery of this experiment is that there are at least two competing systems of which I've spoken. On the one hand, you have the elementary waves coming from D0 and D1 and interfering at the photon source. And on the other hand, you have the elementary waves coming from D0 and D3 where there's no interference at the photon source. Now, a photon must kind of choose at random between these two systems. There's some difference in the probabilities. For example, if the interference is such that there's a more intense wave coming from the D0, uh, D1 system, then a photon is more likely to go in that direction. Now you might say to me, okay, well look, if the photon is more likely to go to the D0, D1 system than to the D0, D3 system, does that mean that there's a depletion of uh, photons going in that direction at certain angles? And the answer is uh, no, because uh, there's more detectors in this system than I've been telling you about, and because of the more detectors, everything balances out so that this system doesn't deplete this system. But basically, it's random whether a photon chooses to respond to the to the elementary waves coming from D0 and D1, or to the elementary waves coming from D0 and uh, D3. Notice that in our way of thinking, there are probabilities, but they are local probabilities. They're easy to understand, quite different than the probability densities and probability waves of quantum mechanics, which are very difficult to understand. Notice also that in our way of thinking, nothing is erased. At no point are there interference fringes which are subsequently erased. If there are interference fringes, then back at the photon source, there was interference. If there are no interference fringes, then back at the photon source, there was no interference. End of story. Nothing was erased. There's also no delayed choice. The reason for the alleged delayed choice in the original publication is that the signal photon strikes detector D08 nanoseconds before the idler photon strikes one of the other detectors. From our point of view, everything important was decided at the laser, where the interference is located and where the photon decided which elementary wave to follow. Thus, the clock should start then and stop 36 nanoseconds later when detector D0 clicks. Thus, we have the unusual circumstance that we have been able to explain the Kim et al. delayed choice quantum eraser experiment without delayed choice and without a quantum eraser. And I've also shown that the complementarity principle is not needed to explain either this or the double slit experiment. These elementary rays are unlike anything you have ever run into before. You may have heard that all waves are defined by carrying energy. These waves carry none. They have no electromagnetism. And each ray from each different point on the target screen is independent of the ray coming from the adjoining or other points on the target screen. Thus, perhaps we should not call them elementary waves, but elementary flux or rays. Even though, as I say, 
elementary rays from different points on the target screen are independent of each other, nevertheless there is a way in which two elementary rays can be very closely associated. And that is, if you think about it, if the world is full of elementary rays going in all directions at all wavelengths all the time, then for every elementary ray going in one direction, there will be a mate, another elementary ray, going in the opposite direction and coaxial, both going in opposite directions at the speed of light. This has not come into my discussion of the quantum eraser experiment. In the world of elementary rays, there is no such thing as a plane wave. This, what I'm showing you here, a plane wave, does not exist. So as I said before, we have chosen in this video to think outside the box, and quantum mechanics is the box outside of which we are thinking. We have not used the concept of complementarity nor entanglement. We have had interference occurring or failing to occur over here at the laser, at the photon source. And if there are interference fringes in the final data set, uh, that means that there was interference over here. If there are no uh, interference fringes in the final data set, nothing was erased. There's no backwards in time. If there's no interference fringes, it means that there was no interference. Greetings, I'm Lewis Little. Jeff Boyd has done a marvelous job here of presenting the elementary wave explanation of the uh, quantum eraser experiment, and I want to thank you for your interest.